You're listening to episode 58 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about the podcast and subscribe to my newsletter, check this episode's notes or go to pastechipotle.com. And you can rate and leave a review for the show using your favorite podcast app. There are only a handful of people in the world that have literally devoted their lives with an unconditional passion to studying, understanding specific culinary traditions. So much so that their works are undisputed sources of reference and have become a sort of roadmap to study those cuisines. The cookbooks, you see, are not the only type of food writing that there is, even if there are recipes mentioned in other types of books. And because of the relatively recent appearance of the discipline of food studies, there are still some blurred lines around the way we see different types of food writing genres, and that's how we end up finding books by the likes of Mexican Microwave Cookery next to Diana Kennedy's The Art of Mexican Cooking on the Same Shelf. If you're a Mexican food enthusiast, you have probably already listened to episode 55, where I featured a conversation I had with Elizabeth Carroll, the director of the critically acclaimed documentary Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy. And hopefully many of you have also had the opportunity of streaming it. And of course, I know that many of you also have some of Diana's books. The premiere of this film has pushed a renewed interest and sense of alarm upon making known to the world that this Mexican food evangelist is almost a hundred years old. And perhaps the world has not yet quite begun to understand the depth, value, and impact of her legacy for Mexico and for the culinary world. I have also noticed that much of what has been written recently about Diana revolves around her personality, attitudes, and opinions about the way she insists that people should understand traditional Mexican food. And she's often described using adjectives such as uncompromising or dogmatic underlying the fact that she has little patience for people who overinterpret and feel the need to adapt traditional Mexican food for refined tasters, which she sees as the bastardization of Mexican food. And while all of this is true, I'm not really interested in dwelling on the comparisons of opinions for the sake of it. Instead, in this episode, I aim to explore through a series of questions, how can we better understand her work? What does it actually consist of? And what impact it has had for Mexico and the world? And how her books can provide an entirely different reading if we approach them with a different perspective. Sounds good, no? Well, let's get on with it. I hope you enjoy this episode. So the first question I ask myself is, what is food writing? And I think is a good starting point because we seldom stop and ponder about how previous generations thought, felt and wrote about food. So let's see how writing about food came to exist, at least in the Western world. And as we do that, I will point out some of the main characteristics of the categories that we will find. 
For hundreds of years, cookbooks were pretty much the only type of works where food was the main subject, and it was addressed through recipes. And writing them down came from the need to preserve the methods, techniques, and recipes when memory and oral tradition weren't enough. Handwritten scrapbooks and printed cookery books were the main way of learning about other cuisines. And recipe writing was mainly done by male chefs and housewives for an audience that was, well, primarily made up female home cooks. In recent decades, there has been an explosion of cookbooks that have created many subcategories to cater for a fast-growing and wider audience. And we can find historical cookbooks, collections of recipes based on literature works, I don't know, think of Jane Austen-inspired tea parties or Harry Potter desserts. The rise of the TV and internet celebrity chef cookbook. And of course, now every restaurant and cafe must have their own cookbook as part of their marketing strategy and business model to build their reputation and visibility. And even cookware and merchandising are part of this formula. Think of Rick Bales or Nigella Lawson. But going back in our timeline... Something happened in the post-war period in the late 1940s when Europe was beginning to get back on its feet and returning to a quote-unquote new normality, which also meant, much to the relief of many, stop eating rationing food. One English author by the name of Elizabeth David started writing about the exotic French Mediterranean coast and describing vividly the food, people and landscape of Italy, immediately capturing people's imagination with the idea of those wonderful flavors, faraway lands and aromas. And with that, the food memoir was born, where travel, eating, first-person narratives and recipes were all blended together. Elizabeth David's books were hugely influential and inspired a whole generation to open up to other cuisines. Diana Kennedy was one of such readers who immediately became fascinated by this idea. Food memoirs really opened up new possibilities for those who became aware that food was something that people were actually willing to read about and that food wasn't only focused on recipes, but the experience of preparing and eating food also was worth writing about. So newspapers and magazines started including columns and articles about people's experiences eating at restaurants or talking about wines or food events, interviewing cooks and producers and letting people know their opinions and recommendations about them. And that became the genre of food journalism, which we still read today on specialized publications, podcasts, television, films and blogs. And then, further on, many counterculture movements happened that sent shockwaves through all aspects of life. And there are two books that are considered to be groundbreaking, as they completely revolutionized the way we see food. And coincidentally, the authors of both books are French. One of these books is simply titled Mythologies by semiotician and philosopher Roland Barthes. And the other book is Distinction a social critic of the judgment of taste by anthropologist, sociologist and fellow philosopher Pierre Bourdieu. To make a very long story short, Roland Barthes pointed out that food is a carrier of our beliefs, our preferences, ideologies, spirituality, and that a single food can have many meanings. Bourdieu, on the other hand, rises the issue of how class, race and education create a specific cultural capital and that taste and food have a language of their own that expresses power, control and behavioral rules. For instance, he demonstrated that bread can be considered as the ultimate religious metaphor, but is also the humblest of foods and a carb-loaded enemy and the synonym of togetherness. These two books, and particularly Roland Barthes, made us aware that the rapidly evolving advertising industry had already mastered 
way before we even realized what was going on, the fine art of shaping our perception about foods and drinks, creating narratives that made us aspire to emulate a specific lifestyle by triggering with advertisement campaigns our emotions and shaping our identities. So these two authors along with, of course, many other academics, shaped what it will become known as food studies. Now, let me make a quick note here. Parallel to all these changes in food writing, governments and multinational organizations like United Nations, for example, they also started focusing on food from a very different perspective, like food security, policies, nutrition, agricultural systems and other related areas. Now, going back to food studies. This fairly new and promising field of research took shape by borrowing methods and tools from history, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, biology, and even semiotics, among other disciplines. The works produced from this field went from being incredibly complex and aimed mainly to an academic audience to well, recognize that, you know, we all could benefit from knowing and understanding, learning more about the role that food has in our social life. So they started changing and producing more accessible work. And chances are that many of you have already been exposed to this type of work. A good example of this is the book Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation by author Michael Pollan that was also adapted for a Netflix series, TED Talks and articles. And even I made a review about it on my podcast Hungry Books. So, the reason why I took the time to give you all of this context in a nutshell is that, in my opinion, it is actually food studies, the category in which I would personally fit Diana Kennedy's work for its richness, scope, and meticulous research, among other things. And in the rest of the episode, I will tell you why by taking a closer look at her work and giving it a little bit more context. Life, as you know very well, is full of serendipitous events, choices and circumstances that shape and reshape our decisions and opportunities. Europe in 1942 was at the brink of war. And if you think our lives have turned upside down because of the ongoing health crisis that we are living through, an actual war is quite a different scenario. So back in England, when Diana, who came from a working class family and was only 19 years old by the time she should have started college, she became instead a lumber jill. That is, she joined the Women's Timber Corps, which was a branch of the Women's Land Army that recruited and trained women during the Second World War to perform jobs traditionally done by men. The timber corps were managed by the Forestry Commission and their duties went from operating sawmills, managing woodland and pretty much keeping the timber industry functioning. And these were, you know, pretty much the type of experiences that will give you a lot of self-confidence and shape your character for life. Take a good look at these sturdy lumber joes on their way to fell their daily bag of forest giants somewhere in Scotland. Felling trees may harden the muscles, but see what it does to the dimples. There's a knack and a great deal of effort in swinging an axe, especially for a girl who's never swung anything heavier than a handbag. Whoever would have thought that among these sturdy log rollers are a nurse, shop assistant, usherette, teacher and so on. A mixed company, but all jolly good fellow. Some decades after the war, Diana Southwood came to Mexico in 1957 at the age of 34, and she did so in the company of her future husband, Paul Kennedy, who she met previously during a trip she took to Haiti while he was covering the turbulent social and political events at the time. It didn't take them long to get together and swiftly decided to settle in Mexico. And that's when her real encounter with Mexican food happened and quickly realized that the food served at tourists' restaurants was absolutely different from what Mexican people cooked at home, ate at traditional eateries, street stalls and markets. 
And this was a true culinary shock for her and an awakening. And like in many other situations before in her life, she didn't back off. If anything, she ran straight towards it. And in spite of not really speaking Spanish, she quickly found her way around, getting familiar with the foods, flavors of Mexican food, and sooner rather than later, she also attempted to cook it. While back in the 50s and 60s, there were plenty of supermarkets in Mexico City, of course, traditional markets, big and small, were then, just like today, the best and most cost-effective way to buy fresh produce, groceries, meats, and even ready-made food, crockery, and other cooking utensils. Through many interviews and in her own books, she shares how she became absolutely fascinated by the variety of edible herbs, fruits, chiles and vegetables that she had never heard of before, and finding more about these ingredients became for her the entry point to understanding the deep connection of Mexican food between aspects such as seasonality, agricultural systems, and the gastronomic traditions of the many cultural regions. And as you can see now, these are things that you can only really notice if you spend weeks, months, and years observing, interacting with people, and asking a hell of a lot of questions. People say, oh my God, your books are so complicated. They're not. You go through, you get a lot of simple recipes. But don't be put off, and you've got to understand your ingredients. It's not a, a, a cuisine or cuisines of high technique like the French, but you've got to understand the reasoning behind the recipes and the ingredients. I've been 32 years in Mexico, cooking with the best cooks, wandering in the villages, so I'm pretty hard to please. Paul Kennedy, who became Diana's husband, was a journalist who worked as a Latin America correspondent for the New York Times. And as is often in the case of famous couples, people tend to know way more about either spouse. So let me tell you a bit more about Paul. He had previously done extensive work covering and analyzing the political and armed conflicts of this region in a particularly complex historical time where guerrillas, US military interventionism, international espionage, Coup d'etat, revolution, and economic miracles were all happening at the same time. And he was regarded by the foreign press and academics alike as one of the world's leading authorities on this region. So by the time he married Diana and settled in Mexico in 1957, Paul had already given her a good head start into having a broad understanding of the social, cultural, and political life in the country. Diana and Paul had a very interesting social life. It was very intense, particularly because of their jobs, as she also became a contributor for the Times. And that gave them access to social circles, where they befriended diplomats, fellow journalists, artists, writers, and people from all walks of life. And she often accompanied Paul on assignments to different states and cities across Mexico, where she became deeply fascinated with the region of food traditions. And as her Spanish improved, she was able to talk more confidently to cooks, farmers, butchers, and people at markets. During an interview with Sarah Greenberg for The Guardian back in 2003, Diana shared that in the early years of her marriage, when they were often invited to parties at their friends' houses, she would ask the host for the recipes for the delicious food that was served, only to be sent between laughs to go talk to their mates, who also told them that she would be better off visiting their hometowns to really see how those dishes were cooked, which she did with an evangelic passion. Now, Diana is often described as the savior of Mexican food, but the truth is that grandiose titles can be slightly misleading and tend to find themselves out of context very quickly, which can be problematic. So let's unpack that idea. One of the things that Diana quickly realized is that there wasn't such a thing as a national cuisine, and trying to describe Mexican food under one concept was nearly impossible. Because food, like many other cultural aspects of Mexico, is incredibly tied into the traditions, geography, and history of each region. 
and she refers time and time again in her books that the survival of food traditions, techniques and recipes in Mexico tend to rely largely on oral transmission and an intimate personal interaction to pass on this knowledge from person to person. And recipes, scrapbooks or cookbooks have little or no use for several reasons. First, the belief that learning how to cook implies so much more than the correct treatment of ingredients. Because for many people in Mexico, it's about ensuring that the next generation becomes the new custodian of centuries-old traditions. Also, and equally important, rural Mexico in the 1960s and 70s was very impoverished, with virtually minimal to no access to education and literacy. By contrast, in large and affluent urban centers like Mexico City, middle and upper class young ladies were expected to be competent housewives, cooks and hostesses. So finishing schools were an essential part of raising their chances of a good marriage. And here I want to introduce you to a key figure of the culinary world in Mexico. The most famous cooking school that has ever existed here, where home economics and household management were also taught, were the schools created by Josefina Velázquez de León, an Aguascalientes-born woman who made a name for herself after moving to the capital, where she became rapidly known among the well-to-do society for her cooking skills and deep knowledge of methods, ingredients, and recipes that went beyond the usual dishes preferred by the upper and middle classes, very much in the style of the famous Isabella Beaton. Josefina also researched and compiled hundreds of recipes that were published in more than 140 books, with irresistible titles like Cooking for the Newly Wedded Bride, Yucatecan Cuisine, and Mexican Food Devoted for American Homes. But there were two key elements to her work that made her a hugely influential personality by the likes of Delia Smith or Martha Stewart. First, she had a very entrepreneurial vision, so she quickly embraced the use of technology to speed up processes, working with famous brands of pressure cookers, ovens, blenders, stand mixers, and other kitchen appliances, which she pushed through her TV shows, radio programs, and printed press. She opened up two schools under the name of Velázquez de León Cooking Academy, where she personally delivered many of the classes. Josefina really pioneered the research of regional cuisines in Mexico at a time when class divisions were very much evident and even more so through the food eaten by indigenous, mestizo and aspirational white middle classes. She championed festive dishes from different cities and introduced ingredients, techniques, and even vocabulary into her cookbooks. While the interest in regional and local foods had made its first appearance back at the end of the 1800s through cookbooks, Josefina used her modern multimedia platform to really amplify the idea that there was much more to be discovered about Mexican food. Now, going back to Diana. After living what she has described as very happy nine years in Mexico, Paul was diagnosed with cancer and sadly died soon after they moved back to New York in 1967, just one year before the terrible student massacre that took place in Tlatelolco, Mexico, days before the 1968 Olympic Games. In New York, Diana was encouraged to start giving Mexican cooking classes at her apartment, which she actually did, as well as starting teaching at Peter Comp's New York Cooking School, while she continued writing for the New York Times. Even at this early point, Diana had already awakened the curiosity of Americans who were the primary audience of her journalistic work, and the impact didn't take long to be noticed. So much so that in 1971, while she was still in America, the Mexican Tourism Board presented her with a medal as a recognition to her contributions towards promoting cultural tourism in Mexico. Around this time, she was also persuaded by her friend and boss, Craig Claiborne, the food editor of the New York Times, to write her own cookbooks capturing her life in Mexico. 
Claiborne had a sharp eye for seeing the writing talent and potential in women by the likes of Mary Frances Kennedy Fisher and Julia Child. Diana agreed and started working with editor Frances McCullough on her first book, The Cuisines of Mexico, which was published in 1972. And funny enough, it was actually at this point when Diana started reading Josefina Velázquez's books for the first time, and they had a profound impact in her further comprehension of the regionality of food traditions in Mexico, as she mentions numerous times. And these books reinforced in her the idea that she had to travel to see and taste to understand it all. So she started doing long research trips to Mexico and soon after she published the Tortilla book in 1975. And after that, she was pretty much done with New York and decided to move back permanently to Mexico in 1976. Two years later, Recipes from the Regional Cooks of Mexico was released and in 1980, she bought a property in Zitacuaro, Michoacán and in a very Mexican fashion, she named her little rural state Quinta Diana. By then, she was already a household name in the international culinary world and a string of honors proceeded, including one from the Mexican Food Writers Association. The prestigious order of the Aztec Eagle was presented to her in 1981, and in 1984, the tourism board, again, honored her work with a jade molcajete, that is a pestle and mortar, just when her book, Nothing Fancy, a book of personal recipes, became an international sensation. We will return with the show after a short break. I know the episode is getting really, really exciting at this point, but I want to make a tiny little pause to tell you that the research and production of this podcast is something I greatly enjoy. But more importantly, I put special care into making sure that this content about the history and traditions that shaped Mexico's culinary heritage is presented in an accessible way and available for free for everyone. So by supporting my work, when you share this podcast with your friends, purchase one of my ebooks, make a donation, or book one of my food tours, whenever that's possible again, you are indeed showing your appreciation for independent creators who bring empowerment, creativity, passion, and diversity to find new ways to discover and enjoy Mexico Mexico's gastronomic heritage. So I invite you to go to pasachipotle.com to know more about my ebooks, my work, and even a little more about myself. Go to pasachipotle.com and get ready to cook, learn, and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. There are literally thousands of articles, interviews, essays, and all sorts of works written about Diana. A simple Google search with the terms Diana Kennedy Cook gives you more than 14 million results. And yet, people just can't agree on what to call her, how to categorize her books, and even Amazon reviews often seem to reflect people's confusion with descriptions like awful vanity project that lacks the inviting warmth of other cooks like Jamie Oliver. Other persons saying, the recipes are unfailingly interesting, but not likely to find much use in American kitchens. Someone else thought that these recipes aren't necessarily hers and that she admits she calls them from other sources. They are unusual and not what I will cook. And last, one person who wasn't impressed at all said, eh, some okay recipes. <laughs> The point, of course, is not to shame any opinion, but to think of the reason why people expect her cookbooks to be an easy-to-follow, simplified, coffee-table cookbooks, and why wouldn't they expect that if bookstores insist on putting her books next to Rick Bales or Thomasina Mears' publications? So what exactly is Diana's work about, and why is it different? Well, a good phrase to begin exploring this is one by book editor Guillermo Osorno, who said that Diana's work is a testament for Mexico's food because it is a window to the memory of taste. 
At the top of this episode, when I talked briefly about how food writing appeared in the form of cookbooks, and from there, rapidly many other types of works about food offer different perspectives by seeing food as a conduit for social dynamics, expressing worldviews. Well, studying all these transformations will help us see that while, at first glance, the earliest work of Diana might fit in a sort of food memoir category, where she passionately shares her admiration for the profoundly meaningful experience she had traveling and learning from home cooks about techniques and ingredients. But as her writing evolves, we see that she added more layers to that and included in the introduction of each section the meanings of certain dishes as explained by the cooks she interviewed and what it meant for their families and communities. From the very beginning of her book writing career, she was particularly careful and I think proud to let us know who her sources were. She tells us about the places and even the circumstances under which she obtained the recipes that she presents. And as her knowledge through her travels, encounters and research became more complex, it also reflected on the way she observed and captured the subtle cultural nuances of celebrations, practices and idiosyncrasies about cooking and conviviality. But there is one recurrent aspect that is present throughout all of her work, and that is the importance of ingredients, their cultivation, selection, preservation and use. And she actually achieved to perfectly identify the central role that agriculture has in the identity and way of life of indigenous and rural communities. And I dare say that this is something that no other foreign writer and very few Mexican cookbook authors have achieved. And instead of entertaining readers with Isi Tacos and Tamales, what she presents is her research of Mexico's cultural and biodiverse food system through its food. And at this point you might think, hey, 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 Rocio, maybe that's pushing it a bit too much. And I hear you. But remember I told you how Diana's experiences as a lumberjill during World War II were seminal for her future? Um, during my young years, uh, it was World War II on, and I was busy in the timber core cutting trees down. Now, ever since then, of course, I've been planting trees, and hundreds and hundreds of trees, and did a tree planting program in the village. And I was the gringa who was going to live there, and they thought, of course, with a swimming pool and all that sort of thing. Little did they know. My latest, I want to say, my latest book uh, was on Oaxaca. It took 14 years because it was going up into the mountains, uh, season after season, year after year, with my sleeping bag and my truck, and um, documenting, uh, especially the use of the wild herbs and the gathered things with which people were surviving. And because I think it's very important to give these totally unknown cooks the great privilege of having their work documented. For five years, the Institute of Biology of the National University of Mexico and the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, CONABIO by its Spanish acronym, worked on a project processing and analyzing the results of, well, 50 plus years of material compiled by Diana. The study of her archives included her field notes, photographic material, specimen samples, and cataloging the edible, medicinal, and utilitarian native plants that she had collected and even cultivated in her own botanical garden at Quinta Diana. This ambitious project that took two years of field work between 2010 and 2012 and three more years to produce a range of resources and documents is particularly focused on the changes in cultural practices and the use and abandonment of certain ingredients and the cause of this, the change of the use of land and the loss of traditional agricultural practices that have led to the endangerment and extinction in some cases of dishes and other uses of plants that were previously cultivated or foraged. 
One of the main goals of this work was to create a catalogue that reflected Diana's deep knowledge on the ethnobiological resources and uses of the products from the three ancestral agricultural centers of Mesoamerica, their heritage crops, forms of use, cultivation, changes, and identifying ingredients of vegetable origin that are at risk of being lost, as well as analyzing and studying the environmental, cultural, and dietary impact of the use of genetically modified seeds, pesticides, and industrial agriculture. One of the project's reports mentions that the conservation of edible plants and its cultivation will help us contribute to the continuation of community rituals and food practices, the equilibrium of the environment, and ultimately the nation's food sovereignty. This pretty much reflects how many specialists, cooks, academics, scientists perceive the value and dimension of Diana's work. And certainly, this is the way I see it too. Much of the results of these projects, known to the public as Diana Kennedy, The Roots of Mexican Cooking, are available on a website where you can find videos, information and documents which have free access and are all in Spanish. So I will leave a link for you on the episode's description. Now, Beyond the undoubtedly well-deserved accolades, ceremonies, medals, titles, and honors she received, including being appointed as a member of the Order of the British Empire, Diana has never been distracted by that. Quite the contrary, she has used that to amplify her message without withholding any strong opinion or criticism, which might make some people uncomfortable. She's been clear about the fact that she's not interested in fame or cultivating her image. Image. And ultimately, as Chef Gabriela Camara puts it, what matters is that Diana feels the weight of the grief and the tragedy of having accumulated all that knowledge and that it needs to be heard and put to use because people need to know about it and she carries that as a moral duty. It had been a long dream of Diana to transform Quinta Diana in a gastronomic research center. But as you can imagine, the logistics of that aren't quite easy, let alone the fact that nowadays Michoacán is at the center of some of the most dangerous drug cartel activity in the country. During the interview I recorded with Elizabeth Carroll, um, the film director whose debut as a documentary was precisely Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy, we talked about what transpired during the filming about Diana's thoughts regarding the future of her work, her house, her archives. And we mentioned that at the beginning of 2020, Diana made public the decision of donating her personal library and archives to the University of Texas San Antonio, where a special collection was created under the name of Diana Kennedy Culinary Archive and Mexican Cookbook Collection. This collection includes printed Mexican cookbooks from the 1900s and personal archival material like photographs, scrapbooks, menus, and even letters yeah, that she exchanged with Julia Child and other cooks and chefs. And the crowning jewels of this collection are the archives of her culinary and botanical research, the field diaries and notes from each state of Mexico. And yes, that is the very same material that helped Conabio to produce the foundation for the protection and study of Mexico's culinary biodiversity. And as I discussed with the director of Fundación Tortilla de Maíz Mexicana, Rafael Mier, on episode 56, the input of this commission, using part of Diana's work, was the key to ensure that the federal law to protect native varieties of corn was finally passed this year in Mexico. Ever the kind of server, and thanks to, I believe, the decades of understanding Mexico from the inside out, I think Diana's decision shows, in my opinion, how much effort she put into making sure that her documents and library were safely preserved and rightfully put to good use straight away. In an interview where she was asked about why choosing the University of Texas, she said, I think San Antonio seems to be a natural bridge between Mexico and the US. Diana is 97 years old. What will happen now? 
Well, to begin wrapping up this episode, Diana spent the most part of 56 years in Mexico traveling, documenting, farming, cooking, and writing about the country's food traditions, which of course is what she's largely known for. But she has also been a very loud critic for the prevalent culture of unnecessary food waste at restaurant kitchens, shaming the extraordinary amount of single-use and highly contaminating materials like plastic bags, containers, and aluminium. She has also heavily criticized the fact that the majority of celebrity chefs have done very little to speak about the flaws and crisis of the global food system of which the restaurant industry is part of. Now talking about sustainability, I really, this is where the scourging comes in, do you really need a chef in London to collapse your eggplant? in two layers of aluminum foil and then throw it away? Do you really need, I mean, cooks throughout the years, even home cooks produce a beautifully piece of cooked fish or steak without, wait a minute, that sous vide? And do you really think that they have, for the sake of perfection for the few, they have license to throw all those tough plastic bags into landfill for future generations? Think about it. I just don't think they have. The point is that Diana's opinions matter, and they might appear as harsh, but apparently they need to be so. I think that the perspective from where she's coming from is from a person who deliberately has had a small carbon footprint and has chosen to have a sustainable life, perhaps inspired by her interactions with rural communities, her reflections and writing about their food practices that indeed are the product of resourcefulness, maximization of natural and economic resources expressed through dishes that are local, seasonal and mostly balanced, which inevitably is going to contrast to the way large industrialized modern cities operate. And that is why she argues that within the food industry, everyone should hold each other accountable, act responsibly for the benefit of the environment and the food security of present and future generations. I'm sure I've got a lot of other things to say, really, but I think it's enough of my complaining. But I want to get everybody worked up about these issues. During an interview she gave for ETA on 2013, Diana said, Nobody has done the work I have, and I have funded it all myself. That is why I'm not rich. <laughs> to which Catherine uh, Shulcott, who interviewed her, noted that even back then, Diana was noticeably concerned about the financial safety of her project. As any independent author can tell you, selling cookbooks and doing cooking classes is not necessarily a fast track to make yourself rich. And Diana even considered selling some of her precious historical cookbooks to keep her estate and projects afloat. Which we know, of course, uh, that didn't happen. But that goes to show you her priorities and how difficult it can be to ensure the continuity of projects like this. History has shown us that humanity tends to be extraordinarily slow at valuing and capitalizing in real time the extraordinary work of individuals like Diana Kennedy. And while she's recognized as a cookery teacher, culinary historian, chef, environmentalist, activist and ethnogastronome, the fact that you pressed play and that I am talking about this, along with thousands of researchers, journalists, cooks and activists, it has to be indicative of something good. And undoubtedly, Elizabeth Carroll's documentary has had a lot to do with this. We hear too often expressions like, we need more people like her, and why aren't many other Dianas? And <laughs> I think now you can appreciate the complexity of her work and how it goes way beyond the average process of recipe writing and a simple road trip, documenting the breadth and depth of the nation's cuisines for decades requires a strong level of commitment. On the other hand, while many people around the world speak of her as a savior of Mexican food, you can also argue that Mexican food saved her. 
Because it gave her a sense of purpose, agency, and a career, it is also fair to say that she benefited largely from a position of privilege as a foreign white woman with many connections and access to the international press and the book industry. And I think she has always been very aware of this, uh, but maybe not so much everybody else. Because she's not the only person that has done extensive research about food studies in Mexico, there are dozens of Mexicans that have specialized in particular aspects and taken different approaches, like Guillermo Bonfil Batalla and his ample studies on corn, Virginia Garcia Acosta and her historical work on bread and wheat, and Janet Long Solis's books on chiles, and I could go on and on. So I think we are better off putting Diana's work in context and see with a fair light her her many contributions and use them to continue expanding on them. Finally, I think that is fair to say as well that you have quite a lot to ponder about how to read Diana's books and find out what is she communicating to you through them. And if you try the recipes she compiled, well, you might as well take the chance to reflect on the fact that her legacy, along with the work of many other authors, carries the voices of hundreds of generations of cooks and farmers who, in the heat of their kitchens, the noise of the markets, and the hopes and dreams that every crop cycle brings, they together build a testament of the social and gastronomic memory of a nation. How does that sound to you? Thank you for listening. This episode was proudly written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. And I want to tell you that there is an accompanying blog post with a transcript of today's episode and, of course, a list of links to Diana Kennedy's books. There's also a series of links to the videos from where I use some sound bites. Um, one is from the Mad Feet Symposium. And, of course, there's a YouTube version of this episode. And to connect with me and find more about my books and work, you can go to pazdechipotle.com. You can follow me on Instagram and the show's Twitter account is at Chipotle Podcast. My email is hello at pazdechipotle.com. Well, that's it for today, my friends. Until the next time. <laughs>